All right, good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to First Christian Church. And I want to send a special welcome to our visitors that we have here today. If you're looking for a church that's open and affirming of you as you are, no exceptions. If you're looking for a place that values diversity of thought, if you're looking for a place that will challenge you to deepen your thinking about God, but not tell you exactly what to think, if you're looking for a place to serve those in our community, region, and around the world, if you're seeking a place to worship through preaching, studying, praying, singing, and playing music, and if you want to be a part of a family of believers who will nurture you and each other, then this may be the place for you. But regardless for your visitor, if you've been here worshiping every Sunday for decades like me, I hope you'll have your spiritual needs met here today. And at this time, we're going to welcome each other as we pass the peace. The peace of God be with you. As you make your way back to your seats, uh, please get up in your hymnals to number 606 and join us in singing God Who's Giving Knows No Ending. 606 in your hymnal.
be seated. All right, as usual, we have lots of uh, things going on today and throughout this week in our life of our church. Uh, the first one I want to mention, of course, today is Stewardship Sunday, Commitment Sunday, where we uh, bring our annual commitments, uh, uh, financial commitments to the church and rededicate ourselves for the following year. And, it's, and in celebration of that, we have a meal. And so everybody's welcome, guests, everybody is welcome to come down after church, um, get to know some folks downstairs, get to have some fellowship and some good food. So that'll be immediately after church today. Um, youth group is, is meeting later today. DWF, DWF board on Tuesday, lunch bunch this week. That's a group of folks that meet weekly from the church and go out to different restaurants for lunch on Tuesdays. This week's at Bruce Terry Drive-In in Barling. Uh, Chancellor Choir re rehearsal as an ecumenical men's Bible study this week. That's on Wednesday. Crazy crafters have a good time on Thursday. So there are lots of things going on uh, this week and, and, up, and other things that are coming up. So um, I want to mention some prayer concerns. The first one is I just found out today that Karen Napier's father, Bill Wilmoth, passed away. Uh, he was uh, up in his 90s. And uh, so please keep, uh, keep his family, Karen, and their family in your prayers this week. Um, also, my parents, Jack and Joy Jackson, keep them in your prayers as they're dealing with dad's uh, cancer. Uh, at the moment, they're doing pretty well. They can take visitors at this time, uh, but be sure if you be sure to contact my mom and kind of schedule that with them. Um, keep Bob Pulliam in your prayers and Ben Maxey. He's had eye surgery. I saw Ben here, so good to have you here. Uh, Tim Randolph's daughter, Sky, turns out to not have to have the procedure from what I hear, but we're happy about that. And uh, keep his great-granddaughter also in your prayers, uh, as, as always. Uh, she's been on our list for a while. Are there any other prayer concerns that we need to bring forward at this time? Okay, well, let's transition to, um, to the good news and... Um, and uh, celebrations. I did not get my job at the water park, but I do have an interview with McDonald's next week, next Wednesday at 9 o'clock. All right, so he's got an interview next week, so let's, let's uh, keep, uh, keep uh, prayers for a great interview there. Mike? On the 12th, 65 years old on the 12th. Happy birthday, Mike Cowan. Glenda. Saturday is a big day. Abby graduates from dental Woo hygiene school. Woohoo! After two years, so praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, amen. Yeah, congratulations to her. Oh, um, on the day of the eclipse, we had a new grandson born. So, uh, and uh, we've been, Dinah's been out there for a while being with the, with the baby and I got to go out as well. So it's, it's that we're very thankful about that. Anything else? Our daughter Lindsay will graduate this Saturday as well. Awesome. Yeah, their daughter graduates this. Just to fill in, um, Sky. I went to the doctor Friday, and the, the report is that the growth is reduced by over 50 percent. So um, I think prayer certainly changes things, and I appreciate that. Prayers are answered there, for sure. Thank you. Amen. All right. Well, without further ado, we'll turn it back over to Reverend Ellis. Thank you, Jack, and welcome home, you and... Diana, and you wouldn't be so bold as to <clears throat> name your grandson Eclipse. Uh, name, I'm sorry, I didn't say his name. No, you didn't. His, na his, name, is, uh, his name is Jackson. Jackson J. Marino. Jackson Jackson? Jackson J. Marino. 
Oh, okay, okay, great, great. Beloved, good morning to you. And what a great day it is. You generally don't expect a crowd like this on a rainy morning. But here you are, beautiful as ever. And I thank God that I'm healthy enough to stand in this place and be looking at you. And what is such a blessing is the openness of the top of this sanctuary. You can not only hear the rain, but you can actually see the rain. And there's no better place to be on a Sunday morning than with God in his house viewing Mother Nature. So I thank you all for being here this morning. I won't be long in what I have to say. I just want to welcome all of our guests who are here today. Justin is here with us, who is the son of Nina. That's your son, right? Did I get it right? All right, good to see you here with your mom. We also have Eric, Dennis, and Mike, who are visiting us today. And I promised them I would not embarrass them. I just want you to know, as you already have felt, I, that, that you are welcome here. You are almost overwhelmed there at the door. I saw all those people converge on you, and I said, I hope they don't run them off. <laughs> but anyway, by the end of today, you will know that you are probably in the friendliest, most welcoming congregation in all of Fort Smith. At least we think we are, and we're working toward that. So at this time, beloved, <clears throat> I'd like to direct your attention to our call to worship, and if you don't mind, to stand and <clears throat> remain standing for the invocation, pastoral prayer, and the Lord's Prayer. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship. Dear Lord, we lift our hands to you. No other help we know. If you withdraw yourself from us, where shall we go? We come to Jesus just as we are, weary, worn, and sad. In him we find a resting place, and he has made us glad. Thank you, God, for meeting us again and allowing us to present ourselves a living sacrifice to praise you and to worship you. Thank you for bringing us through another week safely back to our faith community. We ask for forgiveness of personal and collective sins and ask you to Move all hindrances to answered prayer out of the way. We lift up our prayer concerns and our prayer intentions before your throne. Please meet the needs of your people and especially those who are sick and afflicted with health, personal issues. We lift up the Napier family who's had death. We fear the worst, but we hope for the best. We find our world in division, chaos, hatred, and bitterness. We pray against all the unrest occurring on university campuses around our nation. We ask for peace and mutual understanding. As we begin our month of stewardship commitment, we pray that we devote ourselves to investing our resources to the ministries of this congregation as we continue to make an impact in our community, 
and bringing the unsaved to you. We lift up our graduates, celebrate their achievements as they prepare for the next step on their journey of life. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us that when we pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. may be seated. Today's scripture lesson can be found on page 492 of the Bibles in your pew if you want to follow along there. It's from the Psalms, Psalm 116 verses 12 through 19. What shall I render to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Beautiful. Thank you, choir. God bless you and God keep you. Pray with me. Pray for me. Lord, bless this word. Make it come alive. It's your words and not mine. May they find their way in the recesses of hearts, places that need it. In your name we ask and pray. Amen. Today I'd like to talk about getting serious about stewardship, subject that very few church folk get excited about. But I have a responsibility to teach the whole gospel, the whole Bible, and part of it is stewardship. In the 116th Psalm, and I hope you have left your Bibles open, they call it fact check. You want to make sure that I am correct in what I'm telling you. 116th Psalm is called a Hallel Psalm. Hallel Psalms are a collection of Psalms from Psalm 113 all the way through Psalm 118 that expresses thanksgiving and joy for divine redemption and is believed to have been the same psalm recited by Jesus and his disciples as they left the upper room after the Lord's Supper, according to Matthew 26, 30 and Mark 14, 26. This 116th psalm raises the question, how do we pay God for all the things he does for us? The psalmist goes through a litany of subjects, including death, being the offspring of a woman of God. He goes on to vow to not only be a servant, but promises to pay his vows in the presence of God's people in the house of the Lord. The question on the table is, how do we reimburse God for our time, our talent, and our treasure? What do we return? What shall we render? Those three items, which all begin with the letter T, is the sum total of the word stewardship, managing the resources given to us by God. Somewhere along the way, I'm sure you have heard it said, our life is a gift from God and what we do with our life is our gift to him. When we think about it, everything meaningful we possess can fit into one of three categories, time, talent, and treasure. First, we have been given a certain amount of time, as short as it may seem. We used to say, we are here today and we're gone tomorrow. But now it's fair to say we are here today and we are gone today. Our days are numbered, but we come here knowing that we will one day leave this place. We just don't know when. And then second, most of us, not all of us, have all been given a measure of health and strength and the ability to function and to do things to one degree or the other in order to earn a living and to make a positive contribution to society. And those abilities are called our talents or gifts. I used to teach at Mercy that everyone has talent to some degree or the other. 
And then third, we have been given possessions, both physical and of the human kind. Although we have not all been given the same amount, this we call treasure, material possessions, including buildings, vehicles, tangible items we use to make life more comfortable. And some have much and some have little, but all of us have something. I have news for us this morning. One day we must all stand before God and give an account of all the time, all the talent, and all the treasure he trusted us with while on our journey through this barren land. <clears throat> I've always liked this passage in Luke 12, 48 that says, to whom much is given, much is required, or much is expected. We must answer to God concerning our stewardship or how we managed our blessings. That also includes how we treat people who are in our lives. They are also gifts. You're a gift to me. I'm a gift to you from God. And one day God will ask for us back. That is why you often hear me say, we are borrowed people living on borrowed time. We are on loan from God to one another. Have you ever thought about what you would do with all the time you've wasted and what you would do if you could get it back? Have you ever considered where you might be in life if you had just applied a little more effort, a little more time, a little more energy towards your hopes and your dreams? Has it ever occurred to you to take an inventory of all the currency that has passed through your hands in your lifetime and what you have tangible to show for it. I have, and I have shamefully, underscore shamefully concluded that God has been better to me than I've been to myself. And when it comes to being a good steward of the time he has given me, the talents he has blessed me with, the truth that I have squandered more money than I have saved. I have concluded that there comes a time in everyone's life when they should get serious about the time they have left, what they will spend their energy on, and what they should be investing their treasury in. We should not wait until the doctor tells us we only have a short time to live in order for us st to start getting serious about what God has given us. Does anybody here remember the sermon from last week about King Hezekiah, who was instructed to get his house in order? Why does it take some of us a lifetime before we realize that life is passing us by and some of us have wasted most of our time, most of our talent, and most of our treasure. Why do some young people, not all of them, think they will live forever, have plenty of time to be about their father's business? I can still hear David over in Psalm 27, 25 declare, I have been young and now I'm old. That's my testimony now, folks. I used to be young, now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his offspring in want, the Bible says. I really don't mean to be pessimistic, but there are very few gravestones of people who live to be 100 years old or more. We just have a few days, the Bible calls it three score and 10, which is 70 and says if we take care of ourselves, that'll be four score, which is 80 and anything past that is a real gift from God. The psalmist raises the issue 
in 1, 16 and 12, when he asked the question, what shall I return unto the Lord? All oh, he's done for me. What am I going to do with the time, the talent, and the treasure I have left? I don't want to speak for the writer of this text, but I really want to believe that he was at a place in his life where he realizes that he has put <coughs> here to make a difference. And God has given him everything he needs to get the job done. He can't blame anybody else. He has not been serious about his stewardship. I really don't want to put anybody on the spot but this morning, but have you ever considered your purpose for existence and how far along you are on your divine mission? I hadn't planned to put this in here, but years ago I was sick and during that sickness God introduced me to Rick Warren. I have met him personally who wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. And ever since that day and, and went out to Saddleback and spent a few days there, I realized that all of us were made for a purpose. We were not just made just to be here. God made us. And, and God put us on earth to achieve and concluded that maybe time is running out on our hour clock. God did not put us here just to occupy time and space and only to be a consumer and not a producer. God put us here to keep this thing we call humanity going and not to drag it down. There's a scripture found in Luke 19 that says, occupy till I come. In other words, take care of this. That's what he told Adam to do when he gave him the Garden of Eden. Take care of this. What that means is nothing belongs to us. Our time, talent, and treasure are given to us to use while we are here until Jesus comes for us. When I was first called into the ministry at the age of 30, my pastor, Reverend Melvin Brawl, would always tell us that the saddest verse in the Bible, and you might want to write this down, is Genesis 5.27. And this is what it says. All the days of Methuselah were 969 years. This man lived to be 969. They did back in those days, and he died. What a sad eulogy to have to preach at someone's funeral. What, what a sad epitaph that says they lived and they died they had nothing to show for their life. What a waste. And, and what is so troubling about life is there are too many people skipping through life with a casual come what may attitude and happy about it. We were all made for a purpose. I, I've drilled it home every chance I get that God never made an insignificant person. God made all of us and equipped us with abilities that allow us to make a major contribution to humanity and to the kingdom of God. And God gives us gifts to do it. Gifts like houses, cars, clothes, food, money, in order that we can live and to give back. It's about giving back. He gives us physical gifts which are our abilities and tangible gifts to use to help others. What then shall I give back? I don't think it's an unfair question. I don't think I'm overstepping my bounds to tell you that God is expecting some of our time, some of our talent, and some of our treasure. He doesn't require all of it, just a portion as a token of our thanks and appreciation. And you may get angry with me, but I don't think God would get angry with me for telling you that God doesn't want all your time. God doesn't want, want what belongs, he just wants what belongs to him. God doesn't want all our talents, just what belongs to him. You may get upset and say I'm meddling, but I don't think God would mind me telling you that he doesn't want all our treasure 
All he wants is what belongs to him. And what belongs to him is a fraction of everything, a fraction of our time, fraction of our talent, fraction of our treasure. That's called tithing in Leviticus 2730. And it says the tithe is the Lord's. This is not about money. This is about all of life and being fair with God. This is about God loving us enough not to let us play him cheap or take him for granted. And please don't tell me that you are more frightened of the IRS than you are of God. And please don't tell them I said this. I'm going to get in trouble. David, turn off the machine now. I don't want them to hear this. <laughs> the IRS is the government mafia. They take what they want, and they take it up front. But you got to wait on yours. I'm still waiting on the income tax refund that I mailed in February. God is asking us to give up front and to do it from our hearts. God wants, God would rather not have it if you're going to give it grumbling and complaining, manufacturing excuses of why we can't when it's more of an issue of why we won't. I know you're tired of me talking about these things. I know you want a feel-good word this morning. Not all the words you're going to get are going to make you feel good. They'll challenge you. And sometimes you'll say, man, other times you'll say, ouch. But the truth is, we can talk about growing and building a community for God as we are trying to do. That's our aim here on this hill. But it will never happen without a stewardship commitment from all of us. Time, talent, and treasure. What shall we render? Now allow me to clarify all this, and then I'm going to leave you alone. Maybe. <laughs> God doesn't need our time. He holds time in the hollow of his hand. And I laugh when I think about this. God laughs, I told you this, at our silly little daylight savings time twice a year. God doesn't need our abilities. What could you and I possibly do for God that he could not do for himself? I'll tell you how you serve God. You serve God by serving others. I love what the headstone says on Muhammad Ali's grave, and this is what he said once. Service to others is the rent we pay for our room and board here on earth. Service to others is the rent we pay for being here. God doesn't need what we call treasure. He who trimmed the sky with silver lining and spread it out on a midnight black canvas and paved the streets of heaven with pure gold, then put up gates made of pearl, what would God do with treasure? What can the creator of the universe do with a hundred dollar bill? Stewardship is God's way to determine whether or not we trust him and whether he can trust us. If we don't trust him with our life, how in the world can we say we trust him with our soul? God can't trust us with small things. Why should he trust us with the kingdom treasure and kingdom responsibility? What shall I render? Luke declares, give and it shall be given to you, pressed down and shaken together and running over in your bosom. That means we can't beat God giving. How much is enough? How much do we want? The more we invest in our time, talent, and treasure in the Lord, more he invests back in us. How gifted do you want to be? God can empower you with extraordinary ability. How much money do you want? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But 
does he own you? Therein lies the issue. How serious am I about the Lord? <clears throat> the Lord was serious enough about me to make me, to give me life, to make me matter. I was put here to make a difference. There are serious questions I must answer. The major question I need to come to grips with is, what have I done with what I have been given? That leads me to my next question, which is, what could I have done that I did not do with what I have been given? Then I must seriously consider, what will I do with the time, talent, and treasure I have left? But beloved, the most incriminating question of all, and this ought to scare some of us to death, what will God say when I must one day stand before his presence and give an inventory of what I was trusted with? What did you do with the time I gave you? What did you do with the help and strength I gave you? What did you do with those paychecks I allowed you to earn? What did you render? What will I say? Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen. seated. So um, the other day, Randy Alexander gave me a flash drive with a bunch of history on it from this church. It's, it's, he's put together, spent a lot of time putting together a lot of really interesting history. I'm sure he'd be we uh, willing to share that with you uh, as well. And I haven't had time to look through all of it yet, but it's, it's pretty interesting and one of the things that, that strikes me right off the bat is that this church has a long history, uh, 175 years of history, and that would not have ever happened without the commitment of, of many generations of folks. And uh, this being Stewardship Sunday, um, it made me really think about that. And of course, the word steward a steward is someone who takes care of something for somebody else, something that belongs to somebody else. And the way we use that here in the church is we realize that what we have is God's, 
and our time, our talent, our treasure is God's, and we're returning a portion of that to him. And, and uh, you'll have the opportunity here in just a minute as we come to the table in the uh, corners of our table to place your tithes and offerings. And if you haven't yet done so, you can place your uh, commitment cards there for the year uh, where you've made a commitment to the church to, uh, to support the church financially. But also think about how you can also give of yourself, of your time and talents as well. And then after depositing your offerings, uh, and commitments, then we go to the most important part of our service, and that is the, the uh, Holy Communion. And there's a place for you to, to take the bread and the juice that represents the, the, uh, the body and the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so when you come up, come up through the outside aisles, partake of communion, and then go back through the center aisles. Our communion table is, is God's table. It is open to everyone, no exceptions. So uh, if you're a visitor with us, please feel free to come and, and join with us in this holy meal that connects us not only to, to God, but to each other, and all the way back to the beginning of this church, and really all the way back to Jesus himself on that last supper whenever uh, he, he instituted this tradition. Um, so with that, we'll have the words of institution. On that night when Jesus was betrayed in the upper room, he took the loaf, he broke it, he blessed it. He shared with his disciples how his body would be beaten and bruised in like manner. And then he took the cup and he blessed it. And he stated that this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it. And as often as you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you show forth my death until I come. Let us come now as a community, as a family, as a congregation. Come now.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, pray with me, please. Holy and omnipotent God, you are beyond our power to comprehend. Grant us this day a better understanding of you. God, our Father, we often seem incapable of empathizing with those who perceive we perceive as different from us. Help us to treat others like the brothers and sisters of your family that they are. Most compassionate one, we are quick to ask for your mercy, but too often slow to show it to others. Help us to extend your care to those in need. Holy Father, we recognize that even though we do not often acknowledge it, your gifts have placed us among the most blessed humans in history. Please accept these tithes, gifts, offerings, and commitments, and bless them to the work of this congregation on your behalf. Holy Jesus, we often fall short of your example for us. Help us to live as you have taught us and help us to renew our personal commitments of our time and talents in your service. Holy Spirit, we often become tired and worn down by the world. Refresh us and renew us with your power and your gift of this holy uh, communal meal so we may walk in the way of the Lord. Amen. remain standing as we will sing together, I am thine, O Lord, which is our invitational hymn that declares I belong to God. In all the years that I've had the responsibility of pastoring a congregation, I've yet to find one with more of a spirit of belonging I have sensed here that we belong to each other and you care about each other. We care about being members of this congregation. And it may be that someone is here today who wants that, somebody needs that. We're living in a splintered world where people are not finding the peace and the love and the harmony in the communities that they now are in. I invite you to come to First Christian and be a part of something very, very special. As we sing number 601, I am thine, O Lord. Come if you are here.
let us remain standing until the acolytes have put the candles out and we will join one another, those who wish to stay and dine with us downstairs after the benediction. Father in heaven, thank you for the visitation of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have given power to your word, not to your preacher, but to your word. And we pray now as we go down from this place, you would bless our gathering in Disciples Hall. Bless the food now that has been prepared for the nourishment of our bodies. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do ask and pray it all. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with God's people till we meet again. Let us all say, Amen. Amen.